This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Mike Lee in Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chamel. David, welcome to Five Questions. Good to be here. Nice to see you again. Uh, it's been four years, but uh, you know, you've been up to so much and it's so great to connect with you once again. I wanted to start off by asking, what was it about the magic store you went to when you were a kid that inspired you to become a musician, uh, magician instead of a ventriloquist? Well, we're actually sitting in the replica of that store right now. This is the exact replica of Tannen's magic store that I went in uh, and started my whole career. Uh, I went looking for a dummy, like you said, a ventriloquist figure. It's not really a dummy. It would have been a partner at the time. It was, it was my, it was me, my friend. And instead of doing that, I loved magic. I just fell in love with magic. You know, when I did ventriloquism, my lips were flapping away. Not so good. And my material wasn't that good, but magic, for some reason, I loved inventing and creating new things. I really was an opportunity to create and to, um, to kind of feel like I was exploring new territory. And I loved it, you know, starting with the basis of what existed before and creating new things to take magic forward. Um, I was very lucky uh, to uh, have invented a little trick in French class called Mento Pen. Mento Pen was a little trick with a flare pen. Do you remember flare pens? Yeah. Flare pens. And there was a bit of that of magic in that pen that existed that I was able to interpret to make a magic effect work. And uh, I was 12 years old and that effect got published in the Tarbell Course in Magic, which is a very esteemed from the 1920s on, um, esteemed book of magic. So as a 12 year old, I actually invented something that was uh, in in encyclopedia. So that was pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I do find that once you find something that you know, you enjoy something that you find fascinating and you have natural curiosity, you'll invest more and more of your time in it. And therefore, you know, you're more likely to be creative. You're more likely likely to put in the 10,000 hours to become really good at it. You said the great word, curiosity. You know, if you can be curious about something, really want to learn about things. I'm, I'm curious about a lot of things. That's what I'm blessed with that curiosity. Uh, I'm working with a lot of scientists and engineers, and we all have one thing in common that curiosity to learn, you know, and you squint your eyes and go, what do you mean by that? Or, you know, just to keep learning and sponging information and hopefully being able to use it to, to interpret into something new. Um, and I think that's, uh, I'm very, you know, I'm very lucky, you know, um, my kids are still trying to figure it out, you know? And uh, I say, why can't you just love this or this? They're still trying, which is fine. It's okay to take your time, but look and be curious and you'll probably find that thing quicker. Yeah. And everyone's on a different timeline. You might, find something that you enjoy and you're good at when you're, you know, 50, you know, yeah. like, you know, the founder of KFC, he found it in his old age, whereas someone like you found it when you were younger. So there's no, you don't know how it's going to play out, but oh, okay. staying curious can guide the way. Uh, you're think- known for, you're known for your tricks, like making the Statue of Liberty disappear and escaping from death. What goes through your mind when you perform these tricks, knowing that they could go wrong or they could be exposed? Well, you know, I love creating new things. Uh, Statue of Liberty came from me wanting to tell a story about my mother coming here and seeing Liberty for the first time, seeing the statue and how delicate Liberty is. And now if we take it for granted, um, well, it could be very bad. You know, we see how delicate our freedom is today, you know, in many other countries, they don't have what we have, uh, the freedoms that that uh, we, we enjoy. And I wanted to vanish Liberty to, to kind of, kind of showcase the fact that Take a minute and imagine if we didn't have the freedoms that we have. And uh, there's people in countries, and we're seeing it today a lot, who are trying to find a better life. And we have that life here. We have plenty of challenges, of course, but and plenty of things that we disagree with. But we do have the freedom, in generally speaking. And so the Statue of Liberty Vanish was about that. And I think people remember it not only because it was a big, spectacular thing, but because it had a, a incredible meaning to it. At least I tried to convey that meaning. meaning. Um, exposure, you know, you talk about exposure. This is going to be not five questions. It's going to be 16 questions, by the way. We're splitting these questions up. I see you're a sneaky guy. You ask many questions within each question. I understand. You're, you're only the second person ever to call. The only other person who's called me out on that is Natalie Portman, but she called me out even sooner than you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay for it. I, I do the same thing <laughs> because we're curious, right? We're curious. So um, exposing, you know, uh, people find explanations for my magic online 
And to combat that, I have many versions of my illusions, uh, not only many methods of doing things. If they're correct, I can change methods. But there's something else that lately people have called me out on. A lot of those people who expose magic is me. I create those things. When they say, look at this, they're trying to expose you. I say, you know, that was me that created that video and it's mis disinformation. So there's a lot of that. Don't believe what you read. Uh, although on the internet, everything must be true, right? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and I think one of the things that, you know, fascinates me and connects to a lot of the people I talk to is storytelling. Like your art of storytelling is very unique. There's, you know, fewer people who are magicians than are probably acting or, or, or play music. And so it's it's a little bit, it's more rare, but still it's a, it's a very compelling form of storytelling, just like you mentioned with the Statue of Liberty. Um, but you're, you know, there's other magicians too that have existed and that have probably inspired you. Like, you know, when you profiled the best ma magicians in your book, David Copperfield's History of Magic, which are the ones that most influenced you in, in terms of your career and your tricks? Well, you know, the storytelling was my thing. You know, that was my jealousy of the things you mentioned, movies and music and so forth, who were able to tell things that were relatable. Relatable stories could be told with music very easily, uh, with with movie, both dramatic and, and comedy movies. Uh, it was about relatable information, relatable things. Magic, that didn't really exist. You know, stories existed, but about the land of Egypt or, you know, the, uh, we're going to take you on a magic carpet ride to Persia. In magic, it never was about family or never about what happened to you in your daily life. And for me, it was always about that because of my jealousy of all the other art forms that had a higher profile than magic did. So I wanted to bring magic uh, to the forefront. And I did that by really kind of copying literature and music and, you know, film and music and all, all those things that I loved and audiences loved and were able to relate to easier than magic. Magic is a quality of being amazing, right? That's a great quality. That idea to have an audience's need to feel something wondrous or, or impossible. That's all great. And that stays there. And I've invented a lot of, you know, technology for that, but I didn't want to leave it there. I wanted to, to make the magic. So it was relatable and, and beyond, beyond the sense of wonder. Um, what was your question? <laughs> well, I think one of the things that you're getting to is what, what makes you unique, at least, is that, you know, if you ask people name, you know, 10 magicians, yours is probably going to come up first, right? So a lot of the strategies and a lot of the, you know, advantages and, and branding that, you know, Hollywood does, you kind of did that for yourself in, the, in your own, Stole, yeah. own in your own industry. Yeah. I, I was asking more also about the prof the profiles you did for the book and other magicians and the influence they had uh, thank you. upon thank you. you and your work. Well, you know, this book is a great Christmas gift. <laughs> Buy 10, give it to your friends. It's really beautiful. Um, all the stories in here are about people that I admired uh, as artists, you know, each were different. I mean, Houdini, you know the name Houdini. Uh, Houdini, why is he successful? Because he escaped from things. People can relate to escaping from things. People didn't dream about pulling feather flowers out or making a dove appear. They relate to the fact that you can free yourself from, from a jail, you know, or free yourself from, uh, from a problem, escape death. Um, they, that was a relatable thing. Uh, before Houdini was Robert Houdin. Houdini took his name from Houdin and added an eye to it. He was a great inventor. Probably my biggest inspiration is Houdin because he created uh, technology. He created the first robotics that existed, the first levitation, the suspension using ether in the air, which was the kind of the, the iPhone of the time. That was the coolest thing is back in 1840 to have ether and you could have a chemical and you put people to sleep. Wow, that's amazing, you know, and he used that in his levitation. It's kind of the, the umbrella, the excuse, the, uh, the frame for the levitation of his son. Um, so the ethereal levitation is discussed, you know, in the book uh, and why it's important. This technology here by uh, Alexander, the man who knows. Imagine having a Buddha. A, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the shot. You can't. Uh, there's a, a Buddha. There will be a talking Buddha. The method was a speaker. Nobody knew what a speaker was back then. The fact you could actually have sound come out of an inanimate object with a speaker. A card could be selected and you say, go up to the Buddha and the Buddha would go, seven of spades. Well, you could start a religion. <laughs> it's really amazing. Imagine not knowing that technology exists. So 
I'm very lucky that uh, people who are innovators and scientists and physicists show me their new things very, very early on. And I get to take them, reinvent them and use them in my, my magic to push the art forward. Five years from now, maybe not so easy. That technology will be in everyone's, in everyone's home. But now I get the chance to use new technology. In my live show at the MGM, you know, we have animatronics and dinosaurs and spaceships and things that didn't exist in this, in this magic world. But because I'm fortunate enough to have friends show me new technology that I can use and, or disguise. In the process, I also, with my team, invent a lot of new technology and uh, that will I won't be able to use in 10 years either, you know? So um, magicians have always been in the forefront of new technology. And this book talks about that, how we've, you know, taken advantage. I mean, the movies, the cinema was a magic trick. Just, you need to go into a magic show and you see a train coming at you and you go, whoa. And a magician, George Melies, who was the founder of special effects, but also uh, took that magic effect of the movies and made it a storytelling device. So we have movies uh, that tell stories that, we, that involve us and make us inspired or cry and laugh and all those things because a magician took a bit of technology and told stories with it. So that story is in here too, which is pretty amazing. I love that. And when I also think about everything you just said, it's the customer and the audience's expectations are changing, right? New generations and people who you want to return to your shows, you always have to come up with new things. And of course, you know, there is somewhat of an expectation that, you know, all this new technology, like you were saying, is available. So if you can incorporate that into your show, you become more relevant and take the art forward. And, and just speaking about that, looking about the history of magic, what do you think were the most pivotal milestones that brought the art and the tricks forward? You know, I, I, the tricks is fine to say. I try not to say tricks because the object of me, and it's okay, you can leave it in. You don't have to edit it out. Uh, um, <laughs> I say trick sometimes, but I'm not trying to trick the audience. I'm not trying to trick them. I'm trying to involve them. I'm trying to make them feel part of it. You know, there's not a better than you attitude, unlike my pictures that are like, you know, like this. No, a lot of them, but the really, when I come to my show, I'm kind of part of the audience. And I just happen to do stuff that's pretty interesting or, or unique. Um, so I'm never trying to trick. I'm trying to do illusions. I'm trying to do, you know, create uh, a kind of a, a hyper reality, um, an enhanced reality, the, the infinite possibilities. I like that. <laughs> I do infinite possibilities. Um, and hopefully some kid in the audience will see that and say, I can make that happen for real. Then I've really accomplished something. In the book, the pivotal things, I think, you know, Houdin and the you know, ethereal levitation, Houdini escaping from things, Alexander, the man who knows reading minds, masculine and Devant and Cook who invented a certain levitation device. Uh, I took that idea and made it into flying because people, levitating is pretty good. People lev dream about levitating, but they really dream about flying. So in my show, I used to fly because I knew that it was more relatable and could take this idea way far forward. But that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for masculine, Devant, Cook, uh, Keller, all the people did levitations in a certain way. Um, and uh, even today, Doug Henning, my predecessor in this world uh, of magic, he, he made magic kind of fun and made it kind of like Godspell, uh, hippie-ish kind of thing, trying to be kind of connective to what we were doing today. Didn't dress like a magician, uh, was you know, the classic tuxedo. Going back in time, Houdin dressed in a tuxedo because everyone dressed in tuxedos back then. Magicians didn't get it right. They kept dressing in tuxedos instead of dressing like people do, do in, their, in their particular era. They copied the guy that was dressing like the people at that time and they got it all wrong. So that's why in my shows, except for some old bad pictures of me with a bow tie, I try to dress like, you know, I walked off the street. And I think that's what makes the art really special too. Just as a kid going to magic shows, seeing, oh, if he or she can perform you know, this illusion and levitate, huh, what could I do? And as a kid, it kind of, it does open your eyes to the possibilities. And there's also like you, you know, you go to the movie theater, you see Spider-Man and like all these like mutants and superheroes. And you're like, well, you know, that seems a little bit out of reach, but what David Copperfield just did, hmm, maybe that's more possible because it's right in front of me and he's a real person. Yeah. And it's, and it's live. And, you know, 
I get a lot of inspiration from the Marvel universe. I love it. And back in the day, not so far back, James Cameron, you know, they said, well, how are you going to do, have a career when they can do anything in movies? You can do incredible things. And I loved it. It like really kicked me in the butt and, and, and made me work harder to make sure the magic was teleporting around the world. You know, I would vanish somebody on stage and have them teleport to Hawaii, stretching the envelope beyond just a card trick or a magic with a with a, a dove or a silk you know it was transparent on the world and and then a writer sees that and then he says hmm we can make a series of movies if magic is that we could do now you see me so now you see me grew from me doing that idea of transporting somebody around the world in a credible way we spent three years trying to make it credible with polaroid pictures and signatures to make it you know credible that i really was in another place and it took a long time to make it believable but i think just trying to change the language and, 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 and open up the idea. It was really, really important to me. And what's your best piece of career advice? Is this the last question? This is number five, the magic number. Listen, listen, you know, um, I listen a lot. I listen to the audience a lot. I listen to my um, people that came before me. I listen to other art forms. You know, Sinatra didn't copy other singers. Sinatra copied a saxophone player, the phrasing. He didn't copy other singers. He listened, um, you know, and I think it's true of every single uh, great artist. When people come to my show that really impressed me, you know, when Barbara Streisand came to my show, you know, she'll ask a question and she'll listen. You know, when Michael Jackson came, you know, we hung out back, back in the day and, he would like make you feel like you were smarter than him. And you, were, you weren't smarter than him, but he'd make you feel that way, to pull as much information out of you as possible. And it was great. And I, I do the same thing. I, I really love squinting my eyes and go, well, what do you mean by that? And just trying to get, I listen. And uh, if you've got any kind of, uh, if you're smart at all, you're going to, that's going to help you, you know? Yeah, and well, listening, it's, it's a way of showing respect. And it's a way to learn. So it does both at once. Yeah, and I, my, my audience every night, they're really smart, my audience. And I listen to them. You know, when things don't work, I listen. I talk, in fact, I talk to them after the show with something new. I ask what they're doing. And I study and I listen and I, I make changes. Not everything. There's some crazy people out there. But, but you know, I do listen generally. Uh, and the audience votes. The audience votes. You know, uh, you talked about a minute ago about the customer. You know, it's the customers are your collaborators. They're, they're people that really matter, you know, and anything great, you know, the iPhone, you know, they listened. It had to work, it had to be the graphics, had to be beautiful. A great car, they spent millions to make sure that the door slams feels like a weighty thing, you know, it should feel right. So everything's important. And um, you find out, those important things by listening. That's good advice. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much.